quite fascinating so far yesterday and today. And clearly what we are most concerned about is comparing measurement models. And I, I want to give a, a completely different perspective. I, I'm a bit reluctant to do something, to talk something about the history of and philosophy of science. And the reason I'm reluctant to do so is, uh, was explained by Steven Weinberg, uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And he said that uh, scientists are as interested in the history and philosophy of science as birds are in ornithology. And so I'm now going to try, <laughs> try to explain to the birds uh, a few things that may surprise them, but it will turn out that the history may actually shed light on some of the issues that bother them. And uh, Hans von Storch has several times commented on rather extravagant claims that had been made in the past uh, by various people, and uh, Peter Gent had uh, stories to tell about uh, Klaus Berke making a silly statement, and apparently uh, Mark Cain on another occasion. And, uh, Timmerman was saying this morning, almost implied it's not really clear uh, what it is that we do understand about El Nino, because there's a lot more we don't understand. And uh, So I'm going to try and argue, well, I'll just the, the, the first one is just a quick digression, and, and then I'll get back to this more historical perspective on what is going on. Just a quick digression that uh, Wirtke and Kane and various other people, and including myself, I suspect everybody in this room, at various times we do make very silly statements. And it's probably fairer to look at the more sensible statements people make and judge them by those. And, and I would argue that uh, the, the matter of, of comparing uh, measurements with theories, that uh, Berkey and Kane in particular have made major contributions and have set a standard. And you, you can judge the standard. When I entered this business in the 60s, uh, theoretical oceanography, in Stromberg's words, had a very dreamlike quality. And he actually wrote a paper by that title in the sense that you couldn't really uh, test them against measurements. It wasn't clear what measurements you would have to make. And uh, that, uh, the, the whole studying the response of the ocean to changes in the winds and leading up to the El Nino was sort of, some of the major accomplishments of Wirtke and Kane. And it's an extremely high standard. And I would argue that what I've heard here about the meridional of circulation and some of line is, is back to the dreamlike quality of Stommel. And, and you could actually benefit by looking at what had been accomplished. We, we can digress into that direction and maybe later in the week. But, but there are very rigorous standards. And I'll, I'll just make it just to get these attention. There's a paper by Wunsch and um, Adrian Gill, which is an incredibly um, stringent test for the whole theory of equatorial type waves. And uh, I feel we need tests of that standard. Uh, for the meridional orbitonic circulation. Anyway, that, that's a digression. The, the, the main thing I wanted to talk about is that I feel that the change that has occurred uh, in this business, and you have to be at least as old as I am to be aware of it, is that we've gone from small science to big science. And, and so th this is going to be mostly a case to argue that we actually need a balance between the two. And maybe this group, I know it is the civil science reporters, you know, can help us make a case for that. And so the, the questions, we've, we've gone to big science. And so the question is, what do you mean by big science? And uh, why is big science not preferable to small science? What is the difference? And there's a book by a man called Sala Price written in the 1960s called Small Science to Big Science. And the astonishing thing about this book is that it's the most referenced book in the field called the history of science, and that most scientists don't know about it which is of confirmation for Steven Weinberg's statement. And it, it started out with uh, the, the solar price was money in Singapore, and the library was shut out for some purpose of renovations. He offered to take care of the leather-bound proceedings of the Royal Society. And so it was delivered to his rooms, and he stacked it up against a wall, decade by decade. 
and it was a perfect exponential curve. <laughs> the number of scientific papers being written was increasing at this astonishing rate. And so he started what's now called the science of science. He took this as the scientific papers that are written, uh, who writes them, who references them, and so forth. He took that as scientific data and said, what can you say about this field called science? And uh, the first thing you note is that the doubling rate for just about everything, number of papers, number of scientists, number of PhDs, the doubling rate is about 12 years. The doubling rate for the human population is 50 years. So in due course, everybody's going to be a scientist. <laughs> uh, this obviously can't continue forever. Uh, and then he found out that th this growth, if you look in more detail, is completely undemocratic. And in fact, the, the one main thing you should take away here is that scientists are completely undemocratic activity. A few people do most of the work, and uh, this large number of people who do very little. Um, most papers get referenced once or twice or not at all. Very few papers. In fact, there's something called Pareto's Law that describes this. And so out of uh, 10 papers, three will be referenced a lot out of 110, out of 1,030. If you, if you are at some institute you want to train, you want to train 10 exceptional students, you better admit 100. If you want to train 30, you admit 1,000. Uh, if you go to your, journal, to your library, you look in the journals. Uh, most journals never get taken out. A few will get taken out a lot. This law is remarkably uniform, but it, it simply says science is not democratic. Um, so it, it's sort of frustrating for most uh, people, <laughs> try as they like. They never seem to join this little elite club that does most of the work and so forth. What got Sala Price concerned was uh, as the numbers grow exponentially at this enormous rate. You then need more and more people to support, and these people need more equipment, and so the resources go up. At some point, the people who support science uh, are no longer willing to, uh, to support science for the sake of science. They want uh, some practical return. Uh, so uh, the Sol price, price points out that we really do science for two purposes. Uh, the one purpose is science for the sake of science. And we want to understand phenomena, make measurements and so forth, develop theories. This is mostly done by a very small group of people. Uh, in, in Newton's days, or maybe this was the case, there are complaints in Newton's days, too many papers, too many books to read. Uh, what they did was first create something called Invisible College, simply the few who do most of the work knew of each other, they started exchanging letters, papers. That became the Royal Society. So it was intentionally an elitist group that would enable all of those who do most of the work to get together. But the Solar Price realizes that the way science progresses is quite chaotic and random. Uh, you, you can't really dictate it. However, as the number of people increase, as the needed resources increase, as the resource providers start making demands, science is obliged to become democratic. Okay, at, at, at some points you need to get organized, you need uh, managers, you can't leave science in the hands of these individuals who disorganize them, discriminating against others. Uh, NSF can't have all the money you go to. Aspen, some place, some place to go to Mississippi, some to North Dakota. Uh, you can't have committees with more than two members from Princeton. There must be at least one somewhere else. Uh, the, the whole business becomes really democratic. And what uh, I also got interested in this topic because when I entered the business in the 60s, science was very bottom up. Uh, groups of scientists, and the, the reason I sort of single out Cain and Berkeley's accomplishments, when we started this business in the 60s, Absolutely nothing was known about um, sun, uh, oceanographic variability. There were even speculations as to where the same the tropics there would be any variability you could or couldn't observe and so on. Uh, concepts now taken for granted, like the Calvin wave we heard about this morning. People would question, is there such a thing? That if Calvin wave is a concept that comes out of some simple equations. Why do you think this has anything to do with the natural ocean? So, so what happened is, is in a wake of Sputnik, there was huge concern, the West is behind the Soviet Union. Lots of money poured into it. It was a big bonanza for science, in oceanography in particular. And my generation absolutely benefited from this. We were allowed to do science for the sake of science. If you ask why Berkey made such a fool of himself in 82, saying there's no El Nino and so on, the, the paradox is 
It's probably one of the best described on any episode. We had burning from the water, lots of ships. We'd done our homework, we knew where to what to measure. Nobody had put any pressure on us to, ha- to be practical. And so there was no pressure to actually get those measurements in real time and alert the public. End of the Cold War changed everything. Uh, suddenly scientists had to show they are useful, they are practical. Uh, the pendulum swung. So we had science bottom up, science for the sake of science, I would argue started in the 60s in the wake of Sputnik. It pretty much continued until the Cold War came to an end. Suddenly scientists were forced to become useful. Any proposal you now submit part of the NSF, you have to have outreach component, you have to all the other things you are useful. Uh, you're obliged to start predicting El Nino. I got interested because the, the word El Nino literally means small child refers to child Jesus. And I couldn't understand why it now refers to uh, the biggest disaster we know. And I thought that uh, maybe originally the Peruvian Indians, they get converted to Catholicism. The first thing they do is refer to their biggest disaster <laughs> as child Jesus. Uh, <laughs> and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Excuse me. Um, the Indians who've been converted to Catholicism were actually very ardent Christians. And El Nino literally referred to a miracle in the desert of Peru. The, it would start pouring rain. And there are wonderful letters from the 1890s, even into the 1920s, of uh, how the desert t- turned into a garden, how the number of lambs are born increased, and so on. It was a blessing. Uh, to top it all off, the absence of the cold water fish on which Peru's economy is now dependent. Uh, that was also seen as a blessing because the warm currents from the north brought coconuts, bananas, crocodiles. I mean, this was perceived as absolutely uh, a wondrous thing. And so El Nino, it was given the name El Nino. It was somewhat like it happened shortly after Christmas, Twelfth Night. The, the whole business of changing the name of El Nino to something that means a disaster is very recent, just the last few decades. And uh, I would submit that scientists contributed to this. Uh, once the Cold War ended, once there was pressure on us to be useful, what could be more useful than first declare El Nino a huge disaster and then claim you can predict it? Uh, <laughs> I had an undergrad student who went down to Washington, uh, worked for a summer and came back and told me that uh, he'd worked in the El Nino war room. And, <laughs> and his job was to scan newspapers go on the web and to find out all the damage at El Nino. And then this was presented in Congress. I think there was even a paper in Nature. El Nino causes billions of dollars of damage if we can only predict it with this accuracy, we will save the world and so on. Uh, so anyway, this is sort of just hindsight. So today we're in this big science world. Uh, it's very democratic. Uh, IPCC declares something, hordes of us go out, make those calculations, we put them on the web, implore those hordes who have not yet been involved, please analyze this data. It's a highly orchestrated, highly uh, militaristic type activity. What I dearly miss and what I think is hurting us is, is the absence of small signs. Uh, we've heard only about meridional over circulation and overturning. Everybody gets up talks about pouring fresh water over the North Atlantic is not just the passion, it's the obsession of our community. We should be encouraging people to explore crazy other ideas, have nothing to do with this. Uh, I see a severe lack of small science activities uh, possibly being encouraged. Uh, I, with um, measurement, if you go back to the 60s, what was the big accomplishment? They were entirely because of measurements. We had measurements to test theories test theories of equatorial waves, currents at the equator incredibly complicated eastward, westward, at the surface, subsurface. We have models that succeed in explaining, simulating changes in all those currents, why they are. And that I feel it's no small achievement. People like Wirtke can contribute. So anyway, my plea mostly, A, look at the solar price. Birds should take an interest in ornithology. Uh, and in particular, I, I noticed lots of science writers, I noticed Dick Kerr taking furious notes there, uh, put in a case for small science. Uh, I feel the, the other thing about the democratic approach to science, we simply love consensus opinions. Right? The democratic, what the majority science is not democratic. I mean, even if all the RPCC models say one thing and there's only one model that says something else, it's entirely possible that other model is right. And uh, we, we get to get sway, IPCC will report. 
and they'll have a spread of predictions and everybody tries to be in the middle. Nobody wants to be in the, on the flanks. It's entirely possible the models on the flanks are the right ones, the ones we should be paying attention to. So anyway, the plea again is uh, please pay attention to ornithology. Thank you. Comments? I can report anecdotally, Energy Modeling Forum has for a long time asked climate modelers to go away and run the same experiments on their, on their models. In the, early, in the early days, you could even get them to agree to accept a common set of drivers for their models and then go away and come back and report the results in terms of concentration or temperature or emissions or whatever, but the pay, the, the, the cost of that was that modelers also had to be allowed to pick their own drivers. So there was a modeler's run and then there was the standardized run. And you would compare model results and the variability in the results for the standardized inputs was always bigger than the variability of the results for the modelers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a small comment. Come to Japan, it's not as bad there. <laughs> well, I guess that's it's very interesting what you said because, well, it wasn't the Cold War, right? <laughs> but they're moving towards um, the same the same area, I think, because they see that they can save money that way, or you know, the government is moving towards making people more accountable. But it just isn't at the same level at all. University people can more or less do what they want. So get jobs in Japan. <laughs> I have a or become a social scientist. We work cheap. <laughs> I have a comment too, and that's that despite all the rhetoric at NSF about how important it is to have an outreach component, has anyone actually measured the um, impact of all that outreach? Is it is it working? Is it uh, is it effective? <laughs> or um, you know, is it a, is it a sham? Ask the Kansas school board. 